Welcome to week number eight of BurnerCast, the only podcast where we talk anything and everything hot air ballooning. My name is Joey Strutz. Uh, alongside me again, my two co-hosts, Brett Hosmer and McKenna Seacrest. How was your guys this week? Good, good, good. It was pretty good. How was yours? Uh, you know, uh, up at school, exams are slowly creeping up. So about as good as it can be. But, you know, we're, the weather's starting to get nice. I flew for the first time last weekend. So it's, it's just yeah. really nice that we're seeing balloons, you know, back in the air. Yeah, but exam yeah. time, I always felt like when I was in college, exam time almost meant like, hey, you know, summer's almost here. Because it almost gives you that false reality there because you guys get out so early, not so much you, McKenna, with your weird quarter schedule in Washington. But like for me, when I got out like April, it's like, oh, we should be flying like next week in May's hit or miss so much. It's almost like you feel like flying season's coming, then you get done, you're like, oh, crap. It's either like you're flying a lot or you're not. So it's the, <laughs> that's the hard part about college sometimes. Yeah. All right. Well, we got a great guest for you guys tonight. Uh, he is a still relative young gun pilot. In fact, he finished second at the last young guns championship at the great Texas balloon race. He got his private license in 2018, his commercial in 2019 and a Kuba check racer in mid 2020. Please welcome Bill Bussey's protege, Blake Aldridge to the show. All right. Welcome to the show, Blake. What's up y'all? Uh, good, good to have you on. Good to have you on. Thanks for having me. I've been excited for this. Absolutely. Uh, we, we've been excited to have you on. It's, it's really cool to get, you know, another young pilot on the show with us. We've had Cam, we've had Jenny and we, we, we had to get Blake. Well, yeah, thanks for, uh, you know, thanks for giving me the opportunity. I haven't talked to y'all in a while like this, so it's, it's exciting. Uh, so, you know, the first thing we always go into on the show is, you know, we, we go into really what drew you into ballooning. So can we, can we hear from you? Like what got you started with hot air ballooning? Yeah. So I'm from Longview, Texas. Um, and I've always been around the great Texas balloon race, you know, and actually my mom, you know, she's worked for Dr. Bussey or she worked for him as a dental assistant as dental office for probably over 30 years now. And you know, when he was ballooning, she, he would just ask her if she wanted to help crew. And she said, yeah, you know, and that was in the eighties. And then she met my dad and they've just been a part of it ever since. And, you know, I've seen pictures of my mom, you know, pregnant with me on the balloon fields, you know, off wherever they were that weekend. And once I was born into it, everything, you know, I've always remembered was just balloons going out on the weekends with my little binoculars, you know, looking for all the pretty colors and collecting all the cards and everything. So, yeah. That is so, so yeah. cool. You Thank really you. had the hometown event then, I, which I think <laughs> really cool because not everybody that gets into ballooning has that. Yeah. And it's, I think I, you know, always took it for granted until I was a little bit older because, you know, to me, it was just, you know, Fridays I'd be at daycare or school or whatever. And my, I'd see the balloons fly. And then on the weekends, you know, I'd go out there and see all the awesome balloons. And I didn't realize, you know, how, serious of an event it was and all the things that went into it until I started getting a little bit older and that wasn't really until the nationals came I think it was in 2012 that's when I really started to like see like wow this is awesome you know this I might want to do this so yeah. I totally agree like taking it for granted having a big event near you because like where I grew up in Michigan like they had you know Battle Creek was you know one of the top events along with Longview and kind of when I got into it was when I started going at the downturn and you know, less and less balloons. And when I was, of course, you know, wasn't, a, didn't know anything about ballooning, just kind of spectator. That was when it was in its heyday. Like, you know, you had teams coming with a hundred balloons. You had, you know, before they had 150 with, you know, the international events. And like, now it's looking back and like, you're never going to have a competition events like that ever again with the, like the prize money they had with the amount of balloons they had. Now Longview, at least, you know, through your childhood has kind of kept it up per se. Other than one year, you guys had a flood. It got canceled, I believe. But yeah, I, I, I can't remember what year that was. I think it was like 07 or something. We just we didn't even bother having to bring the people out, which which was a good decision. But yeah, Longview's been doing good these past years. I mean, obviously with COVID and all that, it was it was kind of you know we couldn't have it. But um, I think the level of competition and the amount of competitors has stayed at a pretty good level. You know, ever since I can remember, I I can't mm -hmm. speak for how it was in the the 80s and 90s, but you know the 2000s and the the 2010s, it's been pretty good. Mm -hmm. it's really cool that you were able to grow up going to balloon events and um, experience that and was there a certain moment that you realized that you wanted to be a pilot or what made you realize so 
I think it would be, like I said earlier, when Nationals came to Longview, because when I was, you know, growing up like a little kid, uh, Dr. Bussey, that's, you know, that's, that was our only way for ballooning. So we would fly, um, you know, sometimes passengers at home and we'd go to little events, like we do Longview, we'd go like off close, but he wasn't really serious at the time. And it wasn't until Longview came and I really got to see the big national, you know, big competition and all the people. And I was like, man, this is, this is cool. And then I think I was right when I was around 14, you know, that had been there for years. And I said, I think I want to do this because I just been seeing it these past years. And I just thought it was the coolest thing ever. Mm-hmm. See, like I said, I completely, when Battle Creek at Nationals, I was 14, 13, around there somewhere. And I completely did not understand what I do now about ballooning. And at one point, like I was helping, I'd helped him for a couple of years. Nobody else had helped him any other flights. And I'm like, okay, me as a 14 year old, 15 year old, wherever I was, should not have been the only experienced crew on this guy at a US Nationals. I'm like, the fact that they let that happen is mind boggling. I'm like, I had no idea what I was doing at the time. Like I could hardly set the balloon up. It was just like, okay, like this is like, it just still mind boggling to me that they let me do that. But to get into the main topic here. So you talked about Dr. Busty a lot. How was the experience training with him? Oh gosh, where do I even start? It's, it's crazy. Um, you know, looking back on it, you know, thinking about it going into this, I'm, you know, I, I really think that he's been training me my whole life because I, I remember again, like being 12 at the nationals, we'd be going off to find a good launch spot or something. And he would ask me, you know, what I would think about it or, you know, what I would do or something like that. And those experiences are really, um, important I I keep those to this day you know and when it comes to I think my um, method of finding a launch spot and how I approach a target is um, very similar to him and but you know when I turned whatever 14 I got my student license whatever age it is and I started flying with him he'd be very critical (laughs) Uh, he's a very nice guy and he's a very good pilot you know and he's basically our extended family but when, when you're flying with him, he's, he's tough. Um, I remember we were learning, uh, you know, in case the pilot light goes out, you know, having to do it manually. And most people I talked to, they would just do it on the ground, you know, but he waited till we were at about 5,000 feet coming down at a terminal descent until he started that. Uh, I have it on video. I need to find it. But I, I just remember I was like, oh, my God, you know, I was like trying to relight it. and We're coming down spinning. And he's like, no, you got to be able to do it like this, you know, faster. I'm like, oh, my gosh. But you learn, you know, you learn real fast. And he would make sure that, you know, I I knew what I was doing. We would do. I remember there was one day it was like per, it was the perfect morning. And he I think we did 16 like touch and goes on, you know, and we just go up and down and up and down. And then he, he, he'll unplug your tanks or he'll turn your tanks off and your pilot lights off and he'll mess all your stuff up and you have to, you know, be very vigilant of that. But, you know, because of that, when I, you know, I'll be flying somebody or something and I know to just subconsciously watch those things. And I think that I'm a safer pilot and a better pilot because of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, like we say, you know, I, I have a lot of employees that I manage and of course they don't know anything about ballooning. I always tell them, I said, you today could go out and fly a balloon and you could get it up there. You could be at a thousand feet. You'd be just fine. You know, that's the thing is, you know, you'd be no harm to society at a thousand feet. You could cruise along. You wouldn't be level, I'm sure. But I said, the hardest part's landings. And I think we all can vouch for that. And especially as young pilots, like, you know, you need to learn how to land. That's, I mean, you gotta get down. But I mean, that's really the, the thing I'm glad to hear you focused on is landings. Cause again, like you said, it's landings, landings, landings. So yeah. And that's, and, you know, subconsciously in the back of my head, whenever I'm flying, I know that I'm going to have to land. And I'm always, another lesson you taught me is always look out for your landing place to so know what your speed is, all the different, you know, directions and know, try and know what's ahead of you and to know where you can safely land. And he would make me big, fe- I'm talking the biggest fields in, the east texas and he would say i need you to land in that corner and i was like why do i have to land in this corner i have this whole field he's like well if you need to one day if you're an emergency and you need to land in a front yard that's that size you need to be able to do it and mm-hmm. you know i think that's that's a very important lesson that i think sometimes people overlook mm-hmm. you know, and i th- i think i think that really goes to show like there's no 
there's no one training style per instructor. Like, mm-hmm. you know, each instructor has their own training style. And I think as young pilots, it's so cool to go out there and like get that different experiences with a few different pilots, find out what you like. Uh, you know, I, I had a very different experience with my uh, instructing than you did with Dr. Bussy. And I think, I would have definitely liked to have had an experience like you did with Dr. Bussy. I think, I think that type of, um, that type of training would have definitely benefited me. And I, I think it's really cool that he took the time to out of his day to like really help you out with that. Oh yeah. And that, that's, you know, one most thankful for, cause I, in, in my eyes, you know, he's one of the best pilots I've ever seen, you know, or interacted with or anything. I mean, he's in the hall of fame, you know, and, and to, to get the privilege to learn from one of the greats, I mean, he's been there since almost the start of competition, Blue, you know, in the late 70s. So he he's seen everything and, and you know, he, he would tell me stuff that aren't good things, you know, that he's seen and that can happen. And, but those are things that you have to learn um, what can go wrong as well, because, you know, flying balloons isn't all sunshine and rainbows. You know, you can there's there's not good things that will happen as well. But and also with the different instructors, I learned you know, I, I would take every opportunity to, I talk to every pilot in Longview and I would watch them set up and learn how they do things just because I think it's important that everyone has their own style. And I, I think that my style is a mixture of all those best methods. Well, and the other thing about landings too, that, you know, it's a little tough in your area because we've talked, I've talked to you about it is Longview is not the easiest flying area. Cause I was talking to my instructor, cause I've kicked around doing young guns a couple of times. And I'm like, I'm not quite ready yet. I'd like to, before I get 30. But I mean, Longview, you've told me before you, you packed a couple of pairs of underwear just in case. And it's, uh, it's not always the most fun flying there. So I'm sure the landings were few and far between to practice other than the time you got the nice open fields and had 16. Yeah, no, I, um, I can't tell you how many streets I've landed in or, or, um, just holes, you know, that, that people would be like, why, why, why'd you land there? It's like, well, that's the only opportunity, you know, it's the only opportunity I got. I remember Mm -hmm. right when I got my license, it was like a week before Longview and we were doing a practice flight and I went up with Alan Anderson because it was his first time in Longview and I was supposed to show him around. And I I remember we got up there and he was like, man, y'all have a lot of trees and you can't, cause from, from high up, it's hard to see the landing spots in Longview. There's some times where you have to be, you know, right above the trees and then you see a yard and you go down and take it. So that's not. Well, isn't there that other like exotic animal place or something that's got a lot of I know they landed there during U.S. Nationals. What's that place? I can't remember. What I can't. I, it, it's a little bit out of town. I, I I think that's one of our red areas. I have the map right right here above my computer. And we have a lot of areas. That, over the years, the, the negative part about being in the area so long is you have more opportunities to make landowners mad. So look at this map right here. We have some pretty sizable red areas. And those are so a lot of the time the big fields you'll see. Um, you can't land in because there'll be a bunch of cows or someone will someone will be mad so you, know. so you know moving on we we also saw when you were completing your license you went to a 141 school can you tell us kind of what went into that and about your time there so going into it you know you first of all you have to have a designated examiner to get your license but and dr bussy had taught me i think i was at 30 at 35 hours before I got my license my mom and him talked and they wanted to make sure I would be really safe before I got my license I know the minimum's like 10 hours so we talked and you know Dr. Bessie had known uh, Mike Bowens for a long time in in Utah so one summer I think it was the summer uh, 2018 I was 17 and we went there for I think five days to park city and we we just flew we just flew and it, it's it that was a really good experience because this is another guy who's been around it for a very long time and he the way he did things was completely different uh that was my first time flying an aerostar and it had like that i think it was a spring top so only like a fourth or a third of it opened and we'd be trying to land it i'd just, just be pulling on it and i was like man this thing doesn't want to want to come out and so um but it was really fun he he's a very knowledgeable and nice guy and he's also tough uh we'd be practicing and i'd come down and he'd be like he'd be like no no stop don't do that and then i'd be like oh, i'm sorry you know and, but i think i think going there was a re- really good choice and i i learned a lot from him as well and i I'll, you know a lot of things i learned from him i apply into um like when i'm flying competition and stuff so yeah great. so what were the pros and cons of doing your training at a 141 school I would say the professionalism of it and how 
much more organized it was because the, the one thing about flying with so, and learning from someone that you know is it's like hey it's looking good let's go you know and then it's just how it is but you know we were there for a set amount of time you know and we had to do it there so there were like there were some windy days there were some you know cloudy you know we had to wait a bit I think there was like a foggy day we had to wait mm -hmm. um but I how organized he was and he had just had a fluid system of everything and he made it extremely easy to to learn and pick new things up and to to um you know get my license because you know he's not there to be critical of me to the point where he doesn't want to give me a license he he's he's um tough because he wants you to be a safe pilot um but he's not gonna you know make it impossible for you mm -hmm. and then we also know that you're a commercial pilot too so what were some of the some of the biggest differences between getting your private and commercial rating in the future for that? Um, you know, for learning for both, I'd say that the biggest difference is that for the private license, you're learning to fly. You're learning the how the balloon works, the the science of it, you know, what, what it can do and what it can't do. Mm -hmm. And I'd say for the commercial, it's more, I don't want to say the, the people aspect, but it's more of the you know, legal and, and all this stuff like that. Because, you know, now I can teach someone, I can take, you know, rides for money I can do a lot more things and I have a lot more responsibility and so it's up to me to be able to know the ins and outs of ballooning mm -hmm. you know the flying side the business side whatever you know it's I feel like that's the most important part because in the end you know I have the responsibility now to teach mm -hmm. someone and you know that my opinion a lot matters a lot more now because I'm a commercial pilot yeah, that makes a whole lot of sense. I mean, 141, even though you didn't use the full ability, I'm sure it was valuable to you because mm -hmm. it had, oh, kind yeah. of sounds like you just used it to finish off, which not many people do. They normally go for the full part. But like you said, you you got into young and your parents and, you know, Mr. Bussy made you made you sure you get all that stuff right and you're ready to go. Because, again, they, you know, I, I hear the same thing from my people I train with. You know, we, we want good, safe pilots, you know. We don't want just any Joe Schmo off the street to say, hey, 10 hours later, I have a license. Yeah. You know, we – don't want that because that's how we have issues in our sport so yeah. kind of talk about one of your main passions kind of talk about competition we got into a little you kind of learned from bussy during the nationals years so what's some other kind of key takeaways you have from that so far in competition well i mean i just competition is to me is the most fun now everyone flies balloons for different reasons you know um you know, ride, if you want to do rides, you want to teach people, you know, but for me, it's competition. And I, I fell in love with it when the nationals came to Longview. And fortunately, when it was in Shreveport, because that's an hour drive. So we went to all those as well. And I just think, you know, the first thing about it is just the people. I love everyone that's a part of it. You know, I see them as my extended family. You'll be in Indianola, Iowa one week. And then, you know, a few weeks before that, you saw them same people in Texas, you know, it's cool. And I, I've grown up around those people, but just, you know, how technical competition is and the, the skill it takes to be able to put a balloon, you know, within five meters of where you want to go from two miles away. I think that's just awesome. And I, it's tough, you know, I'm not, I'm not there yet. I'm on, on the level with all these other guys, but that's the fun part, you know, learning, getting better. And I can see progress in myself, you know, actually earlier I was watching my old GoPro footage and I've been putting that thing on ever since I was learning. And, you know, my first ever competition was in Brookfield, Missouri, and I flew over the first target and I just missed it completely. And the second target, I was about, about half a mile off of it, you know, and I didn't do good. And then we had a competition in Longview, you know, I think in October and I hit, you know, almost every single target within, you know, 50 feet. So I, I, and I, I think the progress and in, in being better um, than you were before and is, you know, what I love about it. Yeah. And then you've got some kind of cool stories that you and I have talked about off air. It was like, you know, one of your first competitions, a, a bigger U S competitor kind of wanted to put you under his wing and have you work with him a little bit. And then of course, in Indianola, you had, uh, you had another really, you know, well-known competitor, basically loan your system. So mm -hmm. you've had some pretty, pretty unique experiences in competition so far, I'd say. Yeah. And that, that's what I love about it because I, it was my second competition. It was a little weekender, I think in San Antonio and Joe Zavada was there. Cause he just moved to Texas at time. Um, and growing up, I love the balloon pong videos. I, I watched them all the time. And so I, uh, Joe was one of the people I looked up to 
And then for him to come to me at the pilot briefing the next day and say, hey, do you want to team up? I was like, oh my gosh, me, you know me? And so I th that was really cool. And then like I, in Indianola, something happened to my balloon and, um, you know, someone, someone lent me their balloon, the whole, you know, the, the racer. And that's my first time I flew a racer. And just for, to be in a community where that's possible, where we're competitors, but everyone is so welcoming and nice is just, I, you can't find that anywhere else. I don't think. So, you know, staying on the topic of competition, you know, between you and a few others, Dr. Bussey's really been help, helping youth balloonists learn to compete. Uh, can you tell us kind of about the great Texas balloon races, young guns championship that, you know, Dr. Bussey helped create. Yeah. So that, I mean, that was, that was all him really. He, he wanted, he saw that there were um, young people coming into ballooning a lot more, especially like, especially with my generation, because you have like me, Cameron, Jenny, like all, all these other people. Um, and so he, and he loves Lombie. I mean, that's his, I mean, he created it and that's, his, he loves it so much. He wants it to go on forever and he wants it to be successful, which is, you know, good. I do too. But he saw that there um, weren't very many young people competing anymore. I don't even know who the youngest person was, but he, he always uh, says that uh, ballooning is getting a little too gray. Um, and so he wanted an opportunity because, um, you know, some events pilots in the certain amount of hours. So he wanted young guns to be the thing where any new pilot, you know, within reason could come and they could have their first taste of competition, serious competition under different, you know, limitations. I, I think young guns is it can't be over 10 miles or eight or 10 miles per hour or something wins and just start some other things. Well, we're supposed to be kind of away from the main competitors. But in, in the end, you want it to be a competition for the young kids to learn and to have something between them and eventually move up to the great text balloon race, the big one. And to, but to have that experience of flying in Longview because it's not the easiest place to fly and it's, you know, um, good competition. And um, I remember when he was first telling me about it, you know, a few years ago, uh, he was like, Hey, you know, would you like, he's like, how would you think about that? And I was like, I'd love it. You know, I think it'd be great. And then kind of just talked it over. And I mean, he does most of the planning, but he'll talk to me about it. And I'd be like, yeah, that's good. I, I love that. You know? And then eventually it gets sent through. I didn't think it was going to be a thing, to be honest. I didn't think the board would go for that, but I remember he texted me. He's like, it's good. And I was like, Oh, wow, that's awesome. So, and then we did it that next year and it was great. See, and I think that's something that's so valuable to youth ballooning because not only is the U.S. seeing its first big wave of youth balloonists in quite some time, you're seeing a wave of competitive youth balloonists, you know, mm -hmm. between, you know, you and especially you and Cam, you know, Jenny's starting to get up there now too. You really have a good group of young balloonists that are there and ready to compete. Yeah, I, I noticed that because – of course, um, like the late 80s and 90s, that was when it was massive, you know, blowing, it seemed like. And then it seemed the 2000s and the early 2010s, it kind of dropped off. You know, I think I looked at the pilot registry one time and it, it dropped down a significant amount. But now, I mean, every right when I got my license, I'd, I'd be on Facebook and it seemed every other day someone else was getting their license. And I was like, this is awesome. You know, I, I love to see this. So and I, I think this is um, a good thing. And I, I think that uh, we're trying to eventually, you know, have it a uh, young guns at other competitions as well, you know, besides Longview. And we want to make it a thing one day to where it's its own little circuit for younger pilots that can do for one or two years and they can move up to the, the big guns if they want to. The, the funniest thing about young guns though, <laughs> is Mr. Dr. Bussey was trying to give somebody an eligibility waiver due to COVID. Mm -hmm. now, I think that was hilarious because of course he <laughs> got too old. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and of course he kind of just told him, Hey man, like, let let a, let a younger guy do it. Don't think you know. I don't want to do it. I'll be an old guy, you know. Like, like I just thought it was funny how, how hard he pushed him to be like, oh, we'll give you a waiver. It's like <laughs> I thought that I thought that was pretty funny when that was all going on. And then yeah, so the whole COVID thing happened. And it's like you're gonna be too old now. <laughs> <laughs> he pushed so hard though. Mm -hmm. Like I heard the full story of this, and he's like, oh, you guys should really do it. You guys are thirty now. No. <laughs> yeah. We love you, Dr. Bussy, we promise. <laughs> so we know you finished second place in the inaugural uh, Young Guns competition. Uh, can you kind of go into like that whole week for us? So it was really fun. And I'd say I had the home field advantage, but Longview's, you know, it's it gets crazy and it, the winds will do something that you've never seen before. Um, but 
the whole atmosphere was i think they did a perfect job you know we sat there we were i think we were at the front of the pilot briefings um we had like our own little section and everything um and i think that we or that that year uh, we did it we only flew once and it was that friday morning uh but it was a good flight we had three tasks and i remember uh when we were trying to find a launch point this is when I started doing things on my own. Like I'll, I'll talk with Dr. Bussey and say what I'm doing, but I, I try not to team up really because I, I like to learn on my own and make mistakes, but I think it's paying off now. But anyway, we were doing that and I launched by myself way, way out. And you had to go up to about a thousand something feet to get a good line and then drop down near the target. And I saw no one in the sky. I mean, we'd been out there for like an hour already, like looking. And I was like, man, I wonder what's happening. So I went up, I'm, I'm shooting up. And then I look over under me and there's a, a giant field where everyone's launching from. And they're just oh taking God. a they're taking a low line right to the target. And I was like, oh man, I think I messed up here. But somehow I came down. And I, I think I scored second on that target wow. of the young guns. Um, I, I did pretty good overall. Uh, I think I got second. Petron, I think he scored first on the uh, first target. I scored first on the second target. And then he scored first on the third target. And I scored second. He beat me by just a few points, which I'm kind of upset about still, but whatever. Um, but yeah, I think it was really fun. And it was, it was a good experience uh, flying alongside, you know, all the really big competitors. Um, I think it was a really good experience. So like we saw that you recently bought a brand new racer from Qtech and that is very exciting. So do you want to talk about how that came to be? Okay, so it's a long story, but um, I mentioned earlier, I flew with Alan Anderson in Longview, and he had a brand new Kubitschek. I think he was a 70 racer, and I didn't know he was the dealer at the time. I think he was trying to sell it to me even way back then. But I think the balloon had about four or five hours on it, and we took it up, and he let me fly it, and it was just awesome. Like, I loved it, and that always been in my head. And then, but... I, I, you know, I, know, I didn't want to upgrade from my older system because I've been flying a, um, I think it was a Lynch Strand 69A from like 2001. I think it was about as old as I am, but I love it. I still have it. It flies great. But it wasn't until Indianola when I had to fly that racer. And I was like, man, I, I, I was hitting some targets pretty well. I was like, man, I kind of want one. So I talked to, and Alan was there. And so we talked it over and we said that going into that next January of 2020, we would, uh, start looking at it and then uh, albuquerque was happening and he told me that they'd sold about 40 or 50 already and it'd be backed up till march so we got the order in and then COVID hit and i didn't get the balloon until halfway through the summer but we took it on a long uh, road trip and uh, i think i posted on youtube and we flew all we flew we i think we were out for two weeks and we, we flew all the way from memphis and uh, Indianola, we took, a, it was, it was really fun, but I think flying in a lot of conditions was really good, but yeah. I think, I think Kubitschek is really, really nice. Um, I, you know, my whole life, I think I'd just been around Thunder and Colts and Lindstrand for the later part and come, you know, trying to fly a foreign brand that wasn't the biggest in the United States. I was kind of hesitant on it, but, um, like I said, I, I talked with me and Alan at a lot of races that year and I got to see his balloon up close and I really liked it. So we went for it and I got the 60 uh, racer and it, it flies awesome. And I got the bottom end, the, the Ignis burners as well. And that's, that's my favorite system I've ever flown. You know, I don't mean to toot my own horn, but I think it's, I think it's one of the best balloons out there right now. <laughs> that's great. Well, I'm really glad that you like that balloon, especially not having flown that many cuba checks before yeah it was, it was like i said it was i was hesitant because you know we have to they have to build it there and then we have to import it it was big hassle uh or i thought it was going to be but it really wasn't the they made this mm -hmm. process really easy um and i'm you know it's it's back home right now i'm in college obviously so i can't really fly it, which is a bummer but uh, i've been flying it when i go home and i still fly is great that's great. So how did you choose a design for that balloon? So my old balloon, um, I think, I think Sam Parks made it back in 2001. That was his balloon. It has the, mm. it was the blue and it has the yellow and red checkers. And, you know, being honest, it's a little dated design, you know, with the solid color around it. Spirals are in these days, you know, but um, 
I, I, I wanted to do something like a modern version of that balloon. So if you look at my balloon now, it has, it has still has the uh, yellow and red checkers, but it's more of a kind of up and down pattern across the top and bottom. And then the middle has the, uh, the red and black kind of crisscrossing. I'm going to be honest. I don't know why I did that. I just thought it looked cool in a design and we just kind of kept it. And cause I told Alan, I, I think I sent probably a hundred different designs. I have them all stored somewhere, but he told me he liked that. And I don't know why I threw it in the first place, but we kept it. So <laughs> I really like the design. I think it's really beautiful. Thank you. I think it stands out <laughs> in the sky really well. Yeah. Well, now you get the same colors as Busty. So, you know, we're going to, you guys might feel like the heart closer. You might be blending in at Target from afar. It's like, oh, who's that light bulb balloon? Oh, wait, that's that's not Blake. That's Busty. Well, I don't want to say anything, but I think when he was designing his balloon, I think he liked kind of the colors that I used. So that's why he used those. I, I don't I don't know that for sure, but you know, I know he's probably going to be watching this, but. Ah, uh, we may or may not have an upcoming episode with him, but I have to ask. Oh, yeah. Might not. Uh, so we kind of talked about the, you kind of mentioned it a little bit, the import process. So you said it was really simple. So can you talk about that a little bit with the Cuba check? So I think normally it can, when everything was right in the world, um, they, they would bring it over by plane. So it'd take like a week or so. Uh, they, they would make it, test inflate it, you know, go through all the, you know, whatever they do over there at the factory. And then they bring it on a plane. But because of COVID, they had to bring it on a boat. So I think it was in the ocean for like two months. So that was really fun. Just waiting for the phone call that it was there and then had to go to Florida and then be driven, uh, you know, to where I was. But, you know, Alan and the, the Kubitschek people, they took care of really all of it. You know, we just, I mean, of course, payment and everything, but invoices, everything was really neat and good. And they just tell you, hey, you know, I think it might be delayed a week or so where they're doing this right now or that. So, I mean, I, we were, I was really well informed. Uh, I, I think the biggest issue was time, but I, it, you know, time as time goes on, it's going to not be that anymore, but just, it just happened to be right when I, right when I bought my balloon, it was right when they ordered a whole bunch to America and all those travel restrictions happened. Yeah. And you didn't have to deal with you know, all, all the exchange rate stuff, you know, it was already kind of laid out there for you. So you knew what you were getting was like, Oh, I got to compute all this math. And yeah. yeah. So how did you come to name that balloon? So I'm probably the least creative person you'll ever meet. Um, my old balloon's name was like inheritance. Cause like I inherited the hobby or some, something like that. I don't know. So um, I was talking to my crew guy, Dean uh, and he, he's really funny and creative. And I told him uh, it was from the Czech Republic. And he was like, well, he's like, you really like Czech mix. So he's like, just name it, just name it Czech mix with like the C's E C H. So I was like, you know what, at this point, I'll take it. I need a name because I'm applying for competitions and stuff. So that's what we did. I, I don't think I'll ever change it because I have the cards and stuff now, but I, I, the name's growing on me. Well, I remember you texting me. You're like, hey, would you be opposed? Like, or like, do you think people would be opposed if I just named it Check Mix? I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, I, I mean did text you. I forgot about that. Yeah, I remember I was texting <laughs> you names and stuff. I think I texted you one. You said, oh, there's like four balloons with that name. Well, <laughs> yeah, we were, you and I had made the joke. So, uh, for those who don't know, Bill Bill Bussey's uh, racer that I now own, uh, he called it Blue Diamond. Uh, so I, I was telling Blake, he should call it Blue or Diamond. Blue or Oh, yeah, I forgot, I forgot about that. <laughs> yeah, you told me that. I was considering it, too. I you was know, really considering that. that that's, that's something that, you know, the general public of ballooning really doesn't, like, think about. And especially me, before I, I really started meeting more pilots and stuff. You really don't think about, you know, how the name creation happens. Yeah, a lot of the time I've met, it's just people that it's something personal to them or something like that. It could be something silly, like a dog's name. I think there's one in Longview that was named after the guy's dog that would chase with them. So I think I think for every person, it's personal. And I, th I also think that's really cool. You know, I think you get to see a different side, you know, of ballooning with all the different names and how people, you know, think about make those choices. So, you know, we've seen you fly both Lindstrand and Cameron racers on separate occasions for other reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you, how do you feel the Kubitschek like handles compared to those racers? You know, it's a lot taller. Yeah, it's a lot taller. I, I'd say, I mean, of course, racers are meant to be aerodynamic. I think the one positive of it is I've never like coming down at any high, high speed. I've never had the sides really, you know, cave in or anything like that. I mean, it's, 
it's happened before and it's not that big of a deal, but it's still kind of something you don't want to worry about because, you know, coming down to a target, you will look up and your balloons is doing that and stuff. So, but I, I think it holds its shape really well. And I got the one that has like the white line. So if you're going up really fast, you can hold that and it'll hold the top in. And that's, that's really interesting because I, I forget about it sometimes. But one time I was going up really fast and I just kind of pulled it and it, it gives you a little peace of mind. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I think the, I mean, the way it's rigged and everything is real nice. And I, and they, when you, when you make it, you can say like, if you want like steel or like Kevlar cables, or you can, you can say whatever you want. I mean, there's so many different things you can do. So, I, I mean, I got like the, the racer, you know, the, comp, the big competition version, but um, I think it flies really well in the, those, those uh, Ignis burners are awesome. I mean, I, I like all the Cameron burners and all, thunder and coal. I mean, all burners are modern burners they're about the same you know but the i the squeeze handles and everything and i think they have really good pressure and stuff especially in cold weather that's great that's one of the brands of balloons that i've not flown so it's cool to hear that you like it and you're enjoying flying them it's, yeah it's really it's really good <laughs> the one thing i'll say is the baskets are really have a tight weave which is good they're a little bit heavier so sometimes my crew complains mm. and we have to move it around and stuff they're like why'd you have to get such a heavy basket i was like i'm sorry it's just it's oh, like you funny. know good good quality stuff is just heavy i guess yeah that's interesting so our last question for you is what is on your ballooning bucket list oh gosh um there's a lot of places i want to fly i think that's my biggest thing i want to fly i still haven't flown in nationals by myself yet so hopefully we'll do that this year. Want to eventually fly in Worlds. Um, I want to fly in Japan because that seems really fun and like a completely different experience than America from all the videos and stuff I've seen. So I think that'd be really cool. Um, I want to fly in all the, I see people flying in like the cool landmarks and stuff, you know, in like Central America or like the the, the pyramids or anything like that. I, just Just like the usual stuff like that. Um, I've never flown a hopper before, so I want to fly that. I think that'd be really fun. I, I think I, there's someone in Longview that has them, so I think I think that'd be a cool experience. But I'd have to say just my biggest thing would be to fly in nationals and worlds and to just fly all over the world and have the opportunity to do that. So, you know, the last thing we go to every week on our episodes uh, is you were the brainchild of one of these biggest <laughs> We got our fan questions and our panelist questions. I've been waiting for this. <laughs> so we're going to start off with, you know, the first ones that we ask everybody. We added a new one this week, so you're going to be the I'm first good. one to cut out for us. But, you know, you were the brainchild of this question. We're going to go with your first one. What is your favorite Marvel movie? Okay, I put a lot of thought into this. I'd have to say Guardians of the Galaxy, the first one. I, I love the music. It's really funny. I just remember seeing that in theaters, and I just I watched that movie the other day, and I still love it as much as I did. Yeah, we'll, we'll put you in the same category as Sitco for that one. Nice. I'm, I'm still thinking we need to get you to we get, need to get you to a radio, and the only words you can say in flight are "I am Groot." Oh yes, I think that'd be a very fun experience. So our next one is: What is your go-to pre-flight meal? I don't eat before flights. Um, I just I don't I don't want to say it's my nerves, but it's just one more thing to worry about. And when I'm when I'm flying, especially competition, it's so early in the morning anyway, and I'm never hungry in the morning. And I'm, I'm just focused on f- flying and, and making sure everything's good and right. So uh, after though, I love to go out to eat after we fly, <laughs> but pre-flight meal, I don't, I don't have anything. I was really hoping it'd be Chex Mix. And we had some, you know, Mama Aldridge story of she makes this homemade uh, Chex Mix for you <laughs> and to go fly like banana bread boy, you know? I should do that though. I should have Chex Mix branded or balloon brand Chex Mix that I keep around with me and give to people like shirts and pins and stuff. Hey, you might be able to get an endorsement deal at some point. Who knows? Might be an option. Or you might get sued. You never know. Yeah, it, 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 it's whichever a comes, whichever it's comes first. <laughs> Either or. So, you know, much like professional athletes, if balloonists could have like a walk-up theme song, what would yours be? Hmm. You know what? I'd have to say <sighs> that's a tough one. Probably like a Beatles song. I'm a big fan of the Beatles. Probably like like Hey Jude or like one of their popular ones or something. I, I like I like all their songs. So it, it's probably I have to narrow it down to just a Beatles song. <laughs> so our next one, 
if you could have lunch with one ballooning legend, past or present, who would it be? Hmm. That's a good one. I. It's funny because growing up, I, I have had lunches with a bunch of ballooning legends, and I've heard a lot of stories. Uh, probably a good one would be either Sid Cutter or maybe Jim Burke. Cause, uh, when I got older, he was, a, he's really good friends with Dr. Bussey. And as I got older and he'd be around, I just listened to him talk and he'd just be, he'd always have something interesting, you know, or something to say, or just, he was always fun to talk to. So pro- probably him or Sid Cutter. You know, Jim, Jim's one that was really, really cool to talk to. Mm-hmm. That man had so many interesting stories, and I, I think it's really a blessing that so many people, you know, not just not just down there in Texas, but even in the Midwest, when he directed, you know, the Battle Creek event, the mm-hmm. Howell event, many events up here, uh, we were all were fortunate enough to hear some of those stories from him and get to know him, and that I think that's really cool. Yeah, he, he was such a good guy, and he always knew more than whoever he was with you know and you'd always say something or he'd just be, be like no that's wrong or that or something i remember i remember we were in lobby one time because he was the balloon meister and we were we were sitting at the target and i came up because i was crewing and he was like hey how you doing i was like good and then someone was coming in and he's like oh they're gonna they're gonna do this and they're gonna miss it like 30 feet to the left i was like oh no way and then they did i was like oh wow it's like this guy knows what he's talking about you know the knowledge that guy had was just insurpassable it's, it was really unbelievable to see yeah. Yeah. so we know the first competitive event you did as a pilot was brookfield uh this is our newest question actually was that the first event you did as a pilot or do you have a different one that was the first like overall event yeah as a pilot with my license it, it was brookfield i went it was like a week before school started and we drove all the way to missouri i don't know <laughs> I don't know why we did that, but it was, no, it was, it was fun. It was really good. Everyone was super nice. I love the Midwest. Everyone's so cool. So, I mean, everyone's like that in Texas too. I think Texas or the South and the Midwest are like real find the nicest people, but I had like this volunteer crew and I, they were like big in the community and they were super nice and they were always there helping. And um, I mean, it's beautiful, you know, over there, it's a lot of corn, but you know, it's like everywhere in the Midwest. And it's, it's my first time flying over big fields like that but i thought it was really good i know exactly why you did brookfield mm. why is it's that? my hometown event man that's why oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> i had to you bring up brookfield man that, that dude you can't you can't talk about brookfield without saying it's his hometown event all right it was it was good um one thing it's pretty funny so we were flying we, we only flew once and it was it was pretty windy and that's that was my first time flying in really high winds because long you can't really do that and I could see on the map that after we did everything that there was like a big red area, but then right under that was a little square and it wasn't, it wasn't anything. So I, I landed there and then I think Kenny J landed there. He's a landowner guy. And he told me, he was like, do you know how we're going to like get out of here? I was like, I was like, you're the landowner guy. I was like, what do you mean? Like, I was like, can you not get us out of here? He's like, well, this is supposed to be a red zone. The map just marked wrong. I was like, oh my God. So we were stuck there for like an hour just waiting. And my, my mom was freaking out because it was windy and I was my first competition. She's kind of, she's a worry wart sometimes about me flying. And she was on the other side of the fence. She's like, are you good? Are you fine? That was a fast landing. I was like, it's good. I just, I don't know how we're going to get out. But eventually the landowner let us in. It was funny. So I went there for women's nationals. And we meet at the Walmart parking lot. Those of you that have been to Brookfield or haven't, there's not much to do in Brookfield, all right? So he comes up, and he's got this TV screen, it looked like, for his iPad. He's got the biggest iPad you can have. And he's pointing out, he, of course, he grew up there. He knows every single farmer. This is old Cokie's farm. This is old uh, Stretch's farm over here, guys. And here's little Meredith Bennett with her iPad that's, like, this big. And we're, like, just, like... I, it was just unnecessary. It was so comical, just the two differences. Yeah, but that, that, it was a good event. It was a good first event. Uh, it was pretty windy. I don't know if I I, I should have been flying, you know, because I was a new pilot. But I had my first high wind landing there, and it was real fun. So, and I, I'll I'll end up going back one day. But right now, I have school and stuff. I just can't take that time, you know. But I'll go back eventually. Did you do the parade or not? We did. We did a tiki bar themed. We had because it was me and Doctor Bussy, and we had a. We had, we had a trailer. Okay, get this. So we, there we, there's a van and then the trailer. We had two baskets and two envelopes in the trailer. So when we wanted to do anything, we'd have to unload the baskets and then we'd have to take the trailer off and then get the envelopes out of the back. 
so everything took like an hour but we we took advantage of that and we got we went to party city and we got all this like hula tiki theme stuff and we made a like a bar like going across but that, that was pretty fun i thought the parade was cool yeah i think we uh we might be banned from the brookfield parade <laughs> using air horns oh yeah that they probably didn't like that too much no nor did nor did sean Askren. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, now we're going to our fan questions. Those were our panelist questions. So the first one we got for you. So, do you have a daily hair routine to keep the fro fresh? Honestly, this is all natural, man. I mean, I just, I just got a haircut. It was a lot longer. I cut about two inches off, but um, no, nah, I just shampoo conditioner, man. I go to bed and that's just, just live my day. Like it is. It's some, there's some days I'll admit where it's not cooperating with me and it wants to do its own thing, but I just, I just let it go. You know, I was hoping he had some tips to help me with my receding hairline. (laughs) Uh, There's no hope in that, man. (laughs) So, uh, next one. So, what are you? We know you're going to Texas A&M. What are you studying at school? Yeah, um, I'm currently studying economics, and that I actually had a meeting with my advisor a few days ago, and he said I'll probably graduate a whole year early. So, my my goal right now is to graduate with a bachelor of science in economics, then go for a master's. Uh, I don't know how that's going to, you know, shake up, but well, that's the plan right now. So, yeah. Cool. Besides Dr. Bussey, do you, uh, who's really been your biggest mentor for ballooning? Hmm. That's a tough one. I'd say a lot of the Longview people. Uh, I mean, there's like Guy Gothier's there. Uh, Dr. Bussey's brother, Bruce, who he's one like Albuquerque and he he's really good. They're all really good. Um, they, and they all know something else. I, I, I wouldn't say it's one person. I'd say it's the whole community. And I think everyone did something different for me. Uh, like guy, he, you know, worked at a factory. He, I think he was you know, helped run the, uh, the thunder and cold factory and he's worked with Adams before. And he, if you want something, if you want to know something of how balloon works, you go to him and he'll tell you, um and if you're doing something wrong he'll let you know you're doing it wrong too but he he knows a lot and then bruce you know i think he's the same with dr bussy i mean he's seen everything you know under the sun as well and he could tell you what to do what not to do how you know what this will what will happen if you do that um competition wise i i don't know i i I, I like to think I watch like Johnny Petrin a lot. I, I spent a lot of time, you know, watching what he, he would do and he was always real nice to me. Um, and so just, just people like that in that group, I'd say I learned a lot from. Uh, so our next one, we've all seen your videos from flying, you know, on the new age ballooning channel, mm-hmm. especially. Do you, are you working on a plan to, you know, correct your, correct your baggy throws? We've, we've oh, all, we've man. all seen, uh, the sulks when you get directly over the target and throw it and it goes, you know, the other way or. Yeah. So I was going to release, I was actually going to make a few videos like doing analysis over my flights and I was actually going over them right before this. And there was a flight in Indianola. I hit every single target within about 10 feet of the target and I either under threw it or over threw it every single time. And I just, <laughs> I don't know, dude. I've spent my entire life in glow fields throwing baggies for about two hours. Like I, I remember one event, it was in like Oklahoma or something. I threw a baggie so many times I got like blisters on my hands. Like I've thrown so many baggies and I just don't understand why I'm so bad at it. Every event I'm either going to wind it up. I'm going to hit the, um, the basket. My first ever time in Brookfield, I was throwing a baggie and it got caught in my lines and then I'll just throw it somehow and I'll just manage to make it go backwards. I, I don't know, man. I have to practice that, but that obviously doesn't been helping me. Well, I've also noticed you're left-handed with throwing baggies too. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't know why I'm, I'm part left-handed and right-handed and different things I do. It's funny because winding up, I'll be right-handed, but throwing I'll be left-handed. Um, I don't know if that's the problem it probably is, but you know, who knows? <laughs> um, yeah. I, I, I kind of do everything left-handed and ballooning, which is kind of cool. All right. So our last, our last fan question comes from a uh, fellow pilot, Steve Sitko. So what do you think, you know, the next generation of competition pilots that, you know, you're included in, uh, what do you think that you guys should learn from the current group of pilots that the USA takes to you know, world championships and international competitions? Um, I'd say like the biggest thing that young pilots are good at is technology. Um, Cause I, 
I grew up with our iPads and stuff. I remember when, when your Dr. Bussy finally got Aussie Target on a laptop, he didn't know how to use it. So we put in my hands, he's like, teach me how to use this. I was like, well, I gotta learn it. So I think really good. I think the one thing we could learn um, from the older pilots is I don't saying, saying having funds, a, a, not the right thing to say, but it, it seems like for some reason back in the, the olden days, they did a lot more crazy stuff, but they also seemed like they had a lot of fun. And I feel like today it's, it's a lot more just compete, compete, compete competition, you know? And I think a lot of events have lost some of the, like the cool tasks and things they used to do. Um, so I, I just say like bring fun, you know, and, and the, the really interesting gimmicky things, you know, cause I remember, like, I know a lot of events used to do things like that you know, they have their own gimmick. Um, so I, I think the one thing is like when we, when we approach, cause one day it's going to be us that make events and everything and, and define what ballooning is. So I think that we need to make it fun above all else, you know, and, and make everyone, you know, everyone is welcome. That's, you know, not really a thing to say, but you know what I'm trying to say, you know, I think, I think we need to bring the really adventurous cool element back into it. No, I get what you're saying because you know, as I can't remember who mentioned it, I might have been Zavada on one of his episodes. He said, you know, it, it almost competition nowadays discourages those that have fat balloons. It's kind of mm-hmm. what, you know, kind of he the way he said it. And it's, you know, we, you know, we want you to come to nationals. We want you to come to these competitive events and try them out because, you know, if you're not going, you're not going to learn. Mm-hmm. So I definitely get what you're saying there. There's always room to grow. It's just, you may have to go through that growing pain of, Hey, you know, you got to learn first. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that. So that's going to wrap it up for us this week on BurnerCast. Uh, we'd like to thank Blake for, you know, being our guest this week. Next week, we have our first time ever two guests. We got Carolyn Mum and Jeff Alexer coming on the show to talk about their Reno hot air balloon camp that's put on through them in the BFA. Uh, again, Blake, thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next week on BurnerCast. <laughs>